from. You do a bit of geology, you do a bit of hydrogeology, and then they add the civil engineering together before you finish your master's. So usually when you take the master's, you do advanced cell mechanics. And it's more to gear you towards the design of how you're going to do both deep and shallow foundations as well. So basically that's what I ended up doing with Dr. Okay, so the different types of geotechnical engineering, we have the building and bridge foundations that you've seen. So majority of the overpasses that they are doing, they will have to do a geotechnical investigation for that before the uh, before the structure goes on top of it. You give them bearing capacities and based on that, the structure engineer will do their work and then design it and see how many repairs and all that they have to put in. And then we have the edge structures. That's the one I'm going to talk a little bit more on. Those are the dams and waste dams. So I'm not going to talk about the hydro dams. It will be more on the mining side, the tailings dams that I'll talk about. And then sometimes we use it for offshore drilling platforms. So usually when you see deep water drilling, sometimes they use these foundations there as well. You drill down to, to see where you can anchor right underneath. So that's another one that they do. And then for the tunnels. So that's you really used outside in the west where you have underground um, trains. So that's where they use a horizontal drilling to drill through. And to do that, you need to understand the foundations and see whether you either have to put concrete in or you can just go through it without it and sloughing in. So that's where they use it as well. And then, of course, for highway embankments, sometimes when we build the highways, we have slopes on both sides, and you need to be able to say that the slopes are stable. And also when we do railway as well, we do that. Because you, you bring the railway up, and then you put the um, um, sand underneath, and then you have to make sure that the slopes are stable. So that's one thing that we use it for. And then, of course, retaining walls. So retaining walls, when you know that your, for example, if you need more space and you don't have it, you tend to put a retaining wall and then your slopes are still steeper, and then the retaining wall you hold it. So that's what we use for retaining walls as well. So these are the areas that the technical engineering methods apply that as well. So usually your technical engineering requires the experience judgment grounded in theory. So the theory is when we do, so we do cell mechanics in um, undergrad. We do advanced cell mechanics as a matter. Sometimes you only do undergrad, but because of the practice that you went in, you see yourself doing a lot of your technical work. And then based on that, you have books that you can use to be able to advance yourself as well. So not necessarily that you must do a master's to be a technical engineer. Sometimes you find yourself in the field, and then you learn as you go along, as you make those designs. But a lot of the time, it's a lot of experience and judgment. In terms of that, because for example, if I had a sandy material here that I spend on this side and the water table and everything is the same, I can make the call that you know what this is what it will be here as well. So that's the judgment that I'm talking about. Sometimes the materials are uncertain, and that's something that we have to recognize. Sometimes you might think I have sun here, then you go 100 meters and you have clay, you go another 200 meters and then you have sand again. So that is when the material is very variable. And sometimes you have to tighten any more holes that you have to do, just to make sure that whatever judgment that you make is right. Other times, you might never know. Because you can't drill every single one meter. So you have to accept that risk. And then design it either very conservative or optimize it and then go and then one time. So those are the um, things that sometimes you have to do. So there's something that we call the observational approach, and those who are in geotech, I'm sure you know about it, where you kind of pick a parameter based on the testing that you've done. Then you monitor and see, should I change it when I'm in the field? Because sometimes you might see yourself making changes in the field based on what you are observing in the field. And then you make that judgment call and then move from there. Other times you'll be like, no, I think the assumptions we made are less conservative. So now we want to make it more conservative in the film. And then you still keep monitoring with instruments. So that's the observational approach that for the technical engineering we tend to use. Um, one other thing too is that, especially for dams, usually you want to um, have expert panels. So for, so I can't, Talk about where I work because that's not the reason I'm here. I'm not presenting my work. But in the last place that I work, we had expert panels as well. So even though we design the stuff, we bring these expert panels in to tell us whether what we've done is right. And sometimes they will give us advice that you should do it this way or that way. And that is very, very important because you can have internal 
but you need to have these independent experts who just look at it differently from how you have looked at it because you are so close to it they might give you a different option and a different thing that you do and sometimes they might make you comfortable with the risk that you are taking as well so that's something that we highly recommend especially for high risk structures not just maybe a subdivision house that's low risk but for really high risk you want to bring in expert panels one thing i should have said so as i go through and you have a question it has to be interactive just let me know and then i'll stop and then i'll answer the question as you go and i don't want us to wait to the very end and then we're coming to the slides again so just let me know anyway i threw this in because so this is the foundation that we deal with in canada uh, in northern alberta it's very complex you can start with clay you can start with under consolidated clay you can end up with over consolidated clay we can end up with a consolidated clay somewhere else and then we end up with tills we end up with a channel so it's really complex. So there are some things that we don't know, but in the end, we need to make that judgment call based on available data. It doesn't mean you shouldn't collect data. You need to collect it, but you need to make a judgment call based on what you have and what you want today. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to learn it, just to talk more on um, collaboration and how do you take, because as I went through um, my work, I realized that sometimes people just assume, oh, the geotech gave me this number. I'll just use it. That's it, I'm done with geotech, right? But it has to be an interactive and collaborative process until the project is finished. Because just like we talked about the observational approach, just like we talked about the observational approach, you need to interact with the geotech <coughs> to be able to know what's going on, what has changed, whether the assumption that you take made at the time is what you are seeing in the field. So I'll just a few here. So this is a project that we did. This is in Canada, in Davos Cases. So what happened with this project was that a structure, it was a, it was a consulting firm. They just came in and said, okay, we are building this bridge. We just need you, the geotech engineer, to design a power foundation for us. We think we need only two. That's all they said. We think we need only two. Design the two, and that's all you have to do. So that's the limited scope they gave. So I came in at the very end when it happened. I just need to be clear. And then they drilled these wall holes to 15 meters. And then we said, okay, what was that? They didn't give us the scope for the slopes because it's a bridge that had slopes. They didn't give us that scope. We we're just supposed to give a pass. And then the engineer left the site and the slopes came down. Okay. Now, there's a river just beside, and you know why they like to boat. Everybody has a boat. So you have them boating through it. And then the sun just went through. So when that happens, right, our department of fisheries has to come. And understand whether you've killed a fish or you've done that or you've done that. So it, it just comes in. And then the owner of the, the client said, um, guess what? I was supposed to take timber over this bridge, but now you just made me lose a lot of money. So I'm going to sue them. So he decided I'm going to sue the consultant, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to get a third party to look at this and tell us what happened. So anyway, we went back in. It's a long story, we went back in. We did more geotech investigation. We did a redesign. We ran the slope stability and it was not working. We did everything. It was not working. So we ended up putting in lightweight material at the very top just to let it work. Because we came in and the effective stress was just too much. So we ended up with that. So anyway, in the end, this is what we said. We said, well, we solved your problem for you. Drop the lawsuits. We won't charge you anything. It's free. <laughs> so that's what happened. Anyway, a few engineers did not sleep on this one, believe me. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the next other one that we did. So so this was very, very simple. Sorry to okay. So they should have given us what they should have done, they should have given us the whole scope, right? They didn't give us the whole story. All they said was that we need two piles. Just give us the piles for the bridge. 
and we're not aware that there were slopes that were going to happen as well. And as a consultant, if that's my scope, that's my scope. But as an engineer, under ethics, you have to ask all the questions, right? And then you have to present that to the client and say, you know what, you gave me only this, but I think I have to do that. And then the, and the client says, no, do just this. And I'm like, okay, you told me to do just this. But I think that's the other part that was missing because they were all rushing us to do it now and things like that. So that's a learning that we went with after. Yeah. Let me caution us here that for us to take people, you should stop avoiding people calling so I have a site here, what is it? Can you give me a price for two balls? <laughs> you understand? They will not even give you any scope. Okay, and the most important thing is that geotechnical documents are legal documents. You should put that the back of your mind. It's, they are legal documents. I've been in the box before, high court. Okay, and you will use your report against you. So please, the scoping is very important. You have to sit down with the client and develop a scope before you go out with your application. Okay? It's very important. Yeah. Because that's what I think you think. Somebody, oh, you have a question? Uh, it's similar to what you said. It's as thousands of our structural engineers. They just call you. Even some go to the extent of give me the bearing capacity. <laughs> yeah. This structure is similar. So this is to emphasize that this major role in some of especially foundation yes. by young <coughs> they should be very careful mm -hmm. also make it a plane to you know by the type of equipment you want to use because it has been a bad uh, engineers here because they do constantly but even the by using whether it's super heavy or whether it's a light weight or something, yeah. or what they do is DCBT, somebody comes up with a very capacity, which sometimes is not working. But we are only lucky our grounds here are oh, not complex mm -hmm. as what you have. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's one thing. Yeah. The soils in Ghana is pretty sandy. And that was really because if you have seen a lot of things going down, and people will really, really wake up to look at that. So, all that happens. so anyway, so coming to this, just a simple building, okay, it was a subdivision. And what happened was, was an even settlement crack that was observed in the house. So, creation, and then we found that one side was clear, one side was gravel, right? So the instruction was. Give the clay to competent clay and then backfill with gravel. That was the instruction that was given. And the contractor did not do that. So he didn't dig to competent clay. And the question is that someone would ask, if I was a contractor, I'll say, okay, tell me, what does competent clay mean? And if I don't know, I'm like, engineer, competent clay, let me continue. He showed me. Anyway, he didn't do that. He backfilled it. They start building the house. And then as a result, they just got a building settlement. So the cracks are happening in the house and stuff like that. This house belonged to a lawyer. <laughs> so the house belonged And the lawyer was like, oh, so the thing too with them, the thing is the city has to approve the uh, the footings. So when they put the footings, they, the city engineer came and said, oh, it's all good. And the city engineer left because he assumed that the consultant would have made so the lawyer is like, sir, I'm seeing the consultant, I'm seeing the city, you guys figure this out. So anyway, because it's just a plot, it wasn't really worth it. The city said, you know what, you guys, it's not worth it. We look for another plot. And then all we had to do is we pull a window from this house and take it to the next house. So we turned this area into a because it was supposed to be a playground in a subdivision. So we just turned it into that. But that's what happens when sometimes the contractors don't follow what they see. We ended up getting, um, the city had to give them the house. And we 
No, some of them, some of them, some of them, but um, I worked in Ghana for only three years, so I can't comment too much on how advanced we are, but in terms of advancement, we are far ahead. In terms of that, I can tell you that. In terms of that. Okay, so. Uh, the, the experience over here is that most of our clients, especially the military, I would say military, those who are not in the engineering, so I think most of them don't know that. Uh, an engineer could be sued. <laughs> Situations like that, the structural engineer either will shift it to the, the contractor. Most of our contractors, I think I would say 50% are semi electric So when I say semi electric they don't have engineering background. So see, when there is a failure, Investigation will show was it the structural engineer who could not put up the right logins or the geotechnical engineer who uh, didn't do his uh, work. Then later on, they will shift it to the contractor. The contractor has to have top. So you see that most of the cases, all these people are shifted to the contractor who cannot make it. The structural engineer will confuse you with this moment. To a technical engineer, say, oh, this is the very capacity I will base on this, base on this, base on this. When you call the geotechnical engineer, since he has the institution of engineer stamp on it, you will not even find the police stamp, and nobody will do anything to it. So it's a lesson that they should, at this time, people should know that an engineer could be sued properly. <laughs> yes, let me. Let me. Actually, you have to clarify that. I don't think in Ghana engineers can be sued, and even in Canada engineers cannot be sued. It's the company that you work for that can be sued. Yes. Oh, then we have a lot of uh, a freelance engineers. We have engineers who are in the company at the same time parity. So, <laughs> some are misparity. So, when you, 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 pick up, you pick up the report and you see uh, Joseph Bordet, the social uh, uh, member, so that so, so, so engineer, date, time. You, you look for Joseph Bordet, you call him, maybe you used to have his number. And that will be the phone will be dead, or you can't find him to locate him in the office. You are working in a certain institution, and at the same time, as a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just spend a, a few seconds and explain what happened. Now, things are changing. Um, it's very soon, as regulation is going to come out. Now, the regulation also has a limit on us as what to do. If you are in your tech, that doesn't mean that you can. Do it by killing for six six story building. Understand? It places a limit of what sorry, what you can do. That is why. So as the regulation comes on board, it's now becoming more legal on as what we can do. Now number two, now our communities are becoming very, very sensitive. I think here we had a case whereby somebody was putting up this telecom was going to put up a tower for the, the telecom tower, okay? And they requested for you to take. But the community later refused the company from erecting that tower. Now, they went to the assembly, and the assembly gave them all the documents. They said, oh, this go after me, blah, blah, blah. And they brought it here. They sent it to other stakeholders. What we realized was, because as in the you have a stamp. The document that they have contains both civil and drawings. You see a civil just company medical engineer drawing. <laughs> you know, on ethical. You understand? And I believe that the person who needed the geotech doesn't even know what he was doing. And it was done by a civil engineer. You realize that what they have uh, documented in terms of the drawing, they say a different thing. And the geotech report was also saying, and now the institution has taken serious note. We are suspending the post licenses in Uganda. So please, let's do something. Let people 
are capable of doing that thing. Oh, you understand? We are not saying you should work, but the profession is that we should Okay, if you are not confident, you also do that. And then, very careful, things are changing. Okay. And I, I think, um, like I said, I, I don't know much about it, but so in Canada, before you get your stamp, your stamp is tied to a particular competency and profession. So I can stamp for geotech and tailings and nothing else. Okay. So the structure engineer can stamp only for structure and nothing else. You stamp for something else, you lose your license, and that's it. There is a hearing, and you lose your license. So that's how it works in Canada. And I think it makes sense because if your competencies were built in a particular discipline, you should not be stamping for something else. Ethically, it's just wrong. You don't have to do that. And I think as Ghanaians, we have to do that. It's just wrong. So, for example, um, like I'll talk about the, the tailing dance and things like that. It's a multidisciplinary work when we do closure plans. We get all the five engineers to stop because it's multidisciplinary. Whoever did water balance, you take a hold of it. Whoever did land form, you take a hold of it. You cannot stop for something else. And I think it's something that, um, like Joe said, it's something that we should recognize and then keep doing. In terms of not finding the geotech engineer, I think that we should do better than that. If you give a bearing capacity for something, you should expect that when there is a site, um, when there is a site um, um, investigation or there is a site prep, you will be called to look at it. If you are not comfortable to be called to say this is good, please don't stand it. You should make yourself available and look at it and say, you know what, based on what I calculated and what I saw, exactly. This is exactly what it is today as well. Okay, so let's let's keep that <laughs> let's keep that in mind as we do this. Okay. So anyway, so I think I'm done with them. So we'll go to the rock field. We'll go to the rock field that dams built on tailings. So this one, what happened was that they had a 50 meter um, soft tailings already sitting there as a foundation. And then the government said, no, you need to close it up as a tailings facility because we are just putting the tailings into the lake. And this was in 1923. That happened all the time. Um, so they had 50 meters of soft tailings. They didn't want to establish 50 meters of soft tailings because all it would do that would just liquefy. There is no way you can establish that. So what they rather did was that we put in um, vertical, we just drilled in gravel drains, something like that, filled with uh, ground, and then we just put it into improvement. So it worked, but then over time, what we realized was that uh, we were losing a bit of settlement at the top of the crest, and as a result, we went in, and then, so we're losing the settlement, and then we saw that we're getting piping. I don't know if people know about piping, but basically it's like some of your clear core is just being released out. So we realized that, and then we went in, and then we put an inverse filter, and then we wait. This is very typical because you already have 50 meters of tailings there. There is no way we can take it out. There is there is no other way. We have to build a dam on it, and then you just do an observational approach, like I talked about, and then from there you just top it up, and then we keep going. So that's what happened with this one. And this was very collaborative, actually, between a lot of engineers to get it done. It was pretty cool. So this was a, a railway embankment on a retaining wall. I think we've talked a little bit about the structure engineering thing that you came up with. So, so this one, I led this one. They asked us, they said they needed a, a railway embankment. We did a slope stability, it was all good. There was one area that the slope stability was too fast. So they needed a wall, they needed a retaining wall. So they asked us to look into it and we found out from the investigation that it was bedrock, okay? so. In the description, what I said was that you need to tie the gabion wall into bedrock. Okay. But then the structure engineer moved the whole gabion wall and didn't tell us. So they moved it further and the soil there was all gravel. So then the contractor was there digging to bedrock and he was not finding bedrock. And the contractor is being paid by the volume. So what do you think he would do? He's going to keep digging. <laughs> so he kept digging and digging and digging. So I was in the office and they gave me a call. They are like, we can't find the bedrock. He said that was there. We can't find any rock. And I'm like, where is the Gabion wall? Oh, we put it here. I'm like, 
how we say we should put it. So anyway, we went back. In fact, where the structure engineer had located it was technically not, we didn't really need a big one. So we just said, you know what, just cover it up and then we really did it. And then we went on. But this is one of the things where if the structure engineer changes something, he has to come back to the building. But then that discussion didn't happen, right? So that's why anytime you need something for the structure engineer, just be very collaborative and keep a hand on what they are doing. Because like Joe said, in the end, you have your stamp on it, you are liable for it. So you just need to make sure that you work closely with them. Ask them, if you change anything, let me know. Because sometimes they don't even know that when they change it, it will impact what you've done. So you need to let them know. So anyway, that's what happened with this. We fixed it though, but basically that's, that's what happened with this one. And then this one was my, I think this was more of a good news story. These pictures are not exactly what happened. I couldn't use those pictures for confidentiality reasons. But this one was, we had a railway line, and then we're trying to put a pipeline underneath the railway. So basically what you have to do is directional training to try and take it through, right? So it was very collaborative. When we went in, we, when we did the investigation, we're hitting a lot of rocks. We're not sure what it is. Initially, we thought it was still. We went in and it was a lot of rocks. We took it all out and then we pushed it in with the structural engineer watching, the geotech engineer. And it actually was very collaborative and then we went. And then we had the railway guy trying to stop any train that was coming. So I guess that I should add it. This was one that went really well. And then the last one was a Kegel Lake Dam project. So this was a, a very interesting one. Um, they found phosphate underneath the lake. Okay. So the lake is there, phosphate is underneath it. Well, we still want to mine the phosphate because it's a lot of money. So what happened was that we built a dam and then we pumped all the water from one end onto the other side. And then we got the biologists and the fish and the wildlife people to pick all the fish and throw it on the other side. <laughs> and then we monitored it. And then we got the pits and then we mined the phosphate. So when we're building the dam, because the phosphate is right beside the dam, we need to use clay to make sure that there isn't any water coming through. And that was where it was very challenging. In Canada, it's very cold. Six months of the year is very cold. We don't want to build clay in cold weather. So anytime we got around minus 30, anytime we came back, we told the contractor, you have to remove about three meters of clay up and put the rest on because the frost depth is about three meters. And actually the contractor was not happy, but we had to do that just to keep the integrity of the core because you had a leak on one side and you had a mine on the other side. So this was very collaborative with the fish and wildlife. In fact, we learned quite a bit of different species I've never seen before. So it was pretty interesting. Okay, so I think the last one, I mentioned I was going to talk about the mine closure plan, and that deals with um, a lot of the work that you see, those who work in the Ashanti region, AHAFO, and all that kind of stuff. For the regulations, you need to have a mine closure plan. Oh, you are going to close the mine? because there is communities of interest that live within that area. So in the end, we need to do that. So it's very multidisciplinary planners, tailings planners, reclamation, geotech, civil, landform engineers, and just to bring it all together. So there's a paper that I wrote on how you need to collaborate that. Anybody who is interested, I'll talk to I can give you the paper on how you go through it and the design goals that you need to achieve um, to get there as well. So in summary, I think, and some of you shared those ideas, collaboration is very important. And I see that a lot of our geotech is with structural engineers. So we need to work closely with them. I think sometimes they also do not understand. So we need to explain to them that, look, if I give you this number, and for any reason, you even decide that the structure has to change, you need to come back to me so that I look at it again. Because if your stamp is on it, like Joe said, very soon, if they start repealing people's licenses, that's what is going to happen because you are liable for what you stand. And so you have to really look at that as well. Any questions before I go on to dump designs? Closure of mines. Uh, would it be equated to the guarantee it's not really uh, when you see that uh, we were once commissioned to carry out investigations and all that, and we 
we saw that uh, about 150 to 200 meters from the bank of the base of the river have been mined randomly and have been uh, re filled randomly. Would you describe it as a closure? No, you wouldn't. So, so how would you under closure, so, so look at it. And I mean, Joe can talk about the regulations here, but the little bit I know about the regulations, you have to submit a closure plan when you open a map. And that's the same in Canada. You have to submit a closure plan. And the closure plan needs to be feasible. You can't just submit it and it doesn't work. You have to submit things that work. So for the Galam say it's already illegal. You don't expect that they went through the regulatory process anyway. And I think that's why we are coming down on it because um, and there's another paper that you wrote, I wrote a while back on how the Lansing impacts the groundwater. So that's also available. But then you can see that that's the big thing. It impacts a lot of our groundwater. And also the fact that a lot of our sun, a lot of our material is sand, right? Very, very permeable. So when they do the Galante, it just goes through the sun and then it impacts the rivers that we use as water. So it's really, really, um, really, really that that needs to be dealt with. Looking at the fact that about 45% of our water, drinking water comes from the rivers. So that was another thing. That, but that's not that's not the design pit. Yeah, it's not closure at all because they haven't gone through the regulatory process at all. So, oh, you had a question. Uh -huh. I've not really been part of the foundation engineering project, but I've seen that um, there are some of the projects that they usually do the drawing and the structure engineering outside, and then they ask particular engineering engineers to do the ground investigation and everything. So in that sense, how does the geotechnical engineer collaborate with the structure engineer who is not in Ghana but outside the country? So, I mean, technology is so far advanced mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be an issue at all. There is a lot of teleconferences that can be done to collaborate that. Um, sometimes I've been in the office where I've had some of the people in the film doing investigation. And when they run into problems, they would call you or message you and say, hey, this is what we are finding. What should we do? Should we go deeper? We are like, yeah, go deeper. Or hey, just cut it off and that's it. So I don't think that should be an issue in terms of that. The other thing to realize that if the geotechs abroad are the ones signing off, then they are signing off. So you can get somebody doing the investigation, and I used to do that. I get the juniors to do the investigation, but I'm still signing off. So I'm going to look through all the data. You're going to bring the data to me. I'm going to look through it, and I'm the one signing off on it. So that still works. I mean, I would rather love that the, the Jotex here would do it. But personally, I don't think we have the capacity yet for that. I have to be honest. I haven't seen that yet. I may be wrong. Where is Joe? I don't know yet, but. I want to add something. What she said, I think uh, what is happening is that most of our structural engineers who have dealt with a lot of structural engineers, they make a lot of assumptions. They make the design and uh, use as as far as you may look at some of the design, either foundation and or structural design, uh, and you pick. Assume very capacity and try to put them through this. Then they will ask you to confirm. They will ask the geotechnical engineer to confirm whether they assumed very capacity can sustain what they are. And that's why I've got a drawing from South Africa for an advice of UK where somebody has made a design and they made a lot of assumptions. And for me to confirm whether that certain thing. Uh, whatever he has put there, exactly. whether the type of foundation even he has assumed, maybe it's red, whether it's adequate. Mm -hmm. So, most of the time, I think it's, it's done. So, you can either uh, reject whatever assumption mm -hmm. or, or you confirm it here. And I think that's fine. I think that's fine. If you're asking to confirm or reject, you're also going to use your investigation to come up with your numbers, right? But one thing that you have to learn, I've done it before, if I'm not comfortable. I'm going to say it right away that I'm not comfortable and I will not sign up. And I'm very stubborn for that. If I'm not comfortable, I will not sign up for it. But you're yeah, right, that thing still exists. And I'm assuming that over time, we'll have the capacity in Ghana to be able to do it. 
But right now, it looks as if we are relying heavily on external consultants. So I think a lot of these questions we are getting are because most of the geotechnical engineering that we do is simply interfacing with structural engineers and uh, specifically buildings. Okay. So as far as these structural engineers are concerned, the geotechnical engineer exists only to provide a very capacity to size their foundation. There's a whole lot of things that we should be doing that they're not aware of. Um, I mean, I've seen so many cases where a quantity surveyor draws up the bill of quantities, and he's got a certain amount in there of, you know, rock or hard dig or earth or something like that. But how do they come up with that? It's just a certain percentage that they always pull up. See, whereas things like that should come from the geotechnical engineering investigation. Okay. So, because we are to such a large extent limited to just building foundations. And the structural engineers think what we need to do is to provide a bearing capacity, which after some time they think they can provide. But there's really not enough work for it. And this is how come when you say we won't have the capacity, it, it occurs because you find very few of us are involved in things like tailing dams, very few of us are involved in, you know, sort of railway work, embankments, all these sort of things. It's a lot easier for a quantity surveyor to just put in some figures in there which the client will pay for rather than pay a little bit more for a technical engineer to bring those figures down. Because after all, they get used to the fact that when we do a route of this length, we, you know, we've always got so much in the bill for hard to get things yeah. like that. And until you know, we, we start interfacing with different people other than structural engineers. We're always going to have this problem with the capacity. I agree. And I think um, it also ends up with the, and I'm looking at you because it also comes back to the institution. So the more the institution tightens the competencies and those things and make the quantity surveyors and all those who realize that they are not qualified to do it, that would also help them be taken. Um, organization also needs to happen for that. Recently, I was I had a session with uh, some engineers from uh, uh, local government, right? And I asked them, "What do you use the contingency contract?" I just asked them, and they said, "Oh, um, in case we are excavating, we, we encounter rock or water, we have to put an action." So, what was your geotechnical report doing? You know, here, there's this mindset that geotech is about loading. That is the mindset. So, even in the, what do you call it? The process for building planning, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you are doing geotech as well, right? By the load. So, we want saw a report. We are calling a long body, so it's geotechical report. We saw a report, it's not, we say it's not there. They are doing your ten car report for three or four story building. But it is not. Your ten is side investigation. It is not for three or four story building. No, it's side investigation. They are not interested in just the bearing capacity. They are interested in providing information about the size, the surface, and sub surface condition. You have to listen carefully. Okay? So that your report truly influence the costing of the building. We are telling them. If you get your project wrong, you're going to get everything wrong. You're going to have problems, serious issues with your contract. Do you understand? You're going to have serious issues with your contract. If you did a very good geotech job, you should minimize the impact of conflict on projects. Okay? So I think it's a learning point for us. Let's start, you know, advancing ourselves and knowledge and explain things to our potential clients and our clients as well within the other profession. Okay, so they don't think that your tech is cheap. Without your tech, there's no civil engineer at the You can't be based on that. And it's surprising to me, they think it's only bearing capacity. Because sometimes you need to give what the water table is also at. And I think there was one, I remember a time we got at cinema that the Chinese built a long time ago. We have this national theater. You know they had a water issue. 
And it was mainly because this is a water table issue that should have been part of the data tech report to tell you this is what the water table is, and you have to pump it out before you do that. But that's one thing that so I think um we need to explain it to the structure engineers. I think the big thing is let the structure engineer know that you know what I'm giving this report. When you start digging, it's possible that what I gave you may not be what it is. So you need to call me to have a look. And I think we need to be comfortable to be able to go there and say, you know what, I've looked at it. The soil is competent like I thought it should be, and you can build a foundation. So that's another competency that we need to acquire to be able to do that. Let me add that these days, especially with the youth, they are, um, there's a few pieces, right? You have to look at your uh, investigative reports, then the design report, and then the validation report. And the validation report has to have to um, what is actually construction issues. You should get the tech guy to validate the foundations and even the investigation that you did to ensure that they have captured the footing that is everything is as built, blah, blah, blah. It's good because this is going to the act of to bring a, what is called structural integrity report. Okay. And I asked myself, who has done it for so that we were fine? I'm going to tell you to bring a structure technical report. So what, do you, what are the procedures? So something that we have not seriously established. But if you have done that, in terms of the foundation, you can pick those reports. And then look, this is the foundation. This is what you have. This is Then you do all of that. So there's a lot more to be done. Yeah. And I think the other thing the city can do is, because if you have to pull a permit from the city, you can also request for the geotech report before you get your permit. <coughs> That's a different topic, guys. But anyway, just a suggestion. Just a suggestion. But then, in that case, if you have to pull it, then it means that you are compelled to do it. And I think that's what happened in Canada, where you need to bring the geotech report to get a permit. So the contractor has no choice than to, to get a geotech permit. Well, it means it's a job for me. So that's okay. So I think yeah, we'll now go to the dam designs and tailings management. This is a bit a little bit top heavy, but I'll try as much as I can. Did it work? Um, it didn't work, eh? It didn't work. Okay. I'm coming at You should Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep going. So I just wanted to do this for those who really aren't, aren't into tailors, just to get a bit of excitement out of people, those who are interested in it. So, so basically, a recipe of milling process used to extract metal. So for hard rock mining, all you do is that. When they dig, they go into the pit, rocks, they grind it, they take out the copper and the gold. Yeah, I don't think it was working. Let me see. Oh, it's working now. Okay, good. So they take out the copper and the gold, and then the rest is tailings. And when you come into the oil sands mine, that's the one in Canada, and I think that Zola has it too. The tailings becomes a mixture of water, sand, and clay. And sometimes we have residual features. Because the way the oil sands work is that you have the bitumen inside the sand and we need hot water to extract it out. And then we come up with the tailings and then you have the bitumen. But we don't have the technology to it. So in the end, in the tailings point, you have about 3 to 4% of bitumen sitting there. And we make a joke about it that if oil goes to $200 a barrel, I think we will be mining the tailings <laughs> to take it out. <laughs> but for now, it's still there. So yeah, it's working now. So it becomes a viper, so that's oil sand. So the difference between, and I worked in both, um, I didn't talk about it, but I worked in both hard rock mining and oil sand. So I worked in hard rock before I went to oil sand. But the difference I saw was that the hard rock mining, the tailings is much, much better in terms of consolidation than in the oil sand, because we have a lot of tools that does not consolidate. It takes hundreds and hundreds of so it's been a big challenge in the oil sands in terms of that. So I do this in as a process. I'm not a process engineer. I'm going to try to tell you what the process looks like. But basically, this is what we do. So when you, you come, you come with a whole truss. I'm sure most of you have seen it before. Really huge whole truss. We dig the sand out. So if it's hard rock mine, you're just going to bring the rock. If it's underground, usually when I was underground, we just put a blast and all comes and then the the truck comes and just picks it and then we take it up into the middle. So that's what happened. It comes into a surge vein. We rotate it to break out a lot of the stuff. And then it comes here with the warm water because we need the hot water to, to separate the bitumen. 
And then it goes into our primary separator here. So when it goes in, something called fraud tailings. So that's the one that contains the butylene. And then if you come into hard rock, that'll be the one that contains either gold or copper. Okay. And then the tailings goes to the tailings one. And then you continue it here under fraud. We still refine it a little bit again. And then we end up bringing it into the fraud treatment. So here, it further removes things that we call the tailing solvent recovery. And that one contains naphthalic acids. That's where you have a lot of the polytines that it contains. So when we get it here, and in hard rock mine, that will be the acid that you get as well. And then you get it here, and then that also goes to the tailings, um, to the tailings bond as well. And then this is refined into petrol, into aviation fuel, to the all the separators. And then that's what we sell. So basically, this is how the deposition looks like. So usually we would build the dikes here made of sand. It's the tailing sand that we bring in. We build the dikes. We build it here, and then it contains the material. Here. A lot of the time in the oil sands, we recycle 80% of the water again, and we bring it back all the time. But we still draw about 20% from the river just to make it uh, better for processing um, in the plant. And then that's the same thing here. So when you start any mine, because you have not dug a pit yet, right? You haven't started a pit, you usually start above ground. So here they call it the tailings TSF, tailings storage facility. In Canada, we call it the external tailings plant. They start tailings facility, same thing, but it's above ground. So you do that for a while until you have a pit. And then when you have a pit, you start putting your tailings in pit. And then they start calling that the in-pit facility. So that's how it works. Okay. We usually prefer to go in pit because it's less risky. When you are out of pit and there is a down break and you have a community at the downstream, it's a problem. If the community is upstream, that might be okay. But if they are downstream, that's an issue. So usually we don't want to build a lot of tailings facilities, but you need to build the first one and then you go in pit. Okay. And to turn it into a golf course or something, you still need to look at what you are putting here. Okay. In the oil side, this consolidation zone takes a long time. It takes thousands of years. In hard rock mining, it's much better. It, it, it takes um, sometimes 10, depending on what you have in there as well. So that is much, much better than in the oil sand. So in the oil sand, it's very challenging. And we've done a lot of technology innovation just trying to solve this issue. Okay. So, oh, it went too fast and now it's not working. Okay, so this, this is what I was talking about. So in the oil sands, we have a mixing zone, which is the sand with the clay here. This is what we call matured fine tailings because it's consolidated. And the top one we call fluid tailings because it's now start, started to settle. So we have one that settles, and then we have one that consolidates. And then we have the mixing zone that's mixed with clay and sand. And that one is way, way better. These are the ones that is always a problem. So I threw this in just to talk about the types of dam construction that we do. So basically, this is the type of dam construction that we do. You can do this mechanically or hydraulically. I think a lot of you have seen this. You put this riprap here just to protect it from erosion. And then you have the clay core. So the cargo lake that I was talking about, this is the type of design that we do. And then you have a filter here. And basically, this filter is to make sure that if there is any pipe, if there is any loss of this, it doesn't run through, rather it's just water that would run through and this will be intact. So that's why you need this filter all the time. So in the oil sands, when we do just a tailings dam, we need a gradient of 20 to 1. It's a rule of thumb that we have seen that works for us. And then the next one is the upstream construction. So with the upstream, first you build the first dike, you put tailings here, then you build the next one and you build the next one. So this is becoming a little bit unpopular. And the reason is because here is very, very loose. We don't have a lot of earthquakes in um, Ghana anyway. But the thing that would happen is that when you are loading this on, 
there's a potential that this being loose might liquefy. And if it liquefies, you lose containment. And if you lose containment, you have to shut down production. And if you shut down production, it means someone won't get their money. And someone needs a paycheck. So it just triggers all the way down. So that's one of the things that this is becoming a little bit unpopular because of liquid fashion. So typical living fashion is just the loss of strength of a deposit and then it just flows out. So you're going to see one that happened that I'll talk about. So basically, and this one where you are doing, you really need to monitor. So it's become a little bit unpopular in terms of if you are building a high risk down where you have communities of interest living downstream, you don't want to do this one. You rather want to go with um, the downstream one. Okay, and this is the downstream one. So this is very popular, but this is more expensive <laughs> to build. <laughs> this is very more expensive. It provides a bit of flexibility, but you can see that you have the tailings here, but you are building all under compacted tailings. So equipment will compact this, they'll compact that, compact this, and then keep going. So this is pretty, pretty complicated. And you control the quality assurance is really done. So, but this is more expensive to them that you have to weigh your risk. Like I said, if there's a lot of people downstream and you are worried that should there be an inundation, it will impact them or there will be injury or fatalities, then you want to be tight on this one and use this one. Okay. And this is some this is less susceptible to liquefaction as well because it's pretty tight. You don't expect that to happen as well. The only disadvantage with this is that because you are building downstream, right? If your boundary is here, so for example, if you have a boundary here that you can't go beyond, you have a problem. Because now you have to go and negotiate with maybe a chief or something like that to get more land. And that's a different story in Ghana. So, so that, that's, the, that's the restriction with this one where if you don't have enough land on the other side, it's, um, it's a bit of a... It's a bit of a tiny issue when you, you go with this. But this is usually the most preferable that people use. Oh. Again. And then the final one is the center line. So the center line is a combination of the upstream and the downstream. This is no bad as well. This is this people built this. This is popular too. But the thing with this one is that because you build right on top of the other. If the foundations here is not the greatest or they are clays, you need to wait for the fall pressures to dissipate. And sometimes it will take a long time. So if it will, it means you have to stop and wait. And then when I stop and wait, it means I have to stop production. I'm not going to make money. I can't pay salaries. I can't pay taxes. And the government is waiting for their taxes. So that's the disadvantage of this one as well. Um, but if you are very confident about your foundations and they are pretty good, you go ahead and do this one. So the center line is not bad as well. So those are the different types. So I just threw this in just for those who have never seen how cell construction gets done. I just threw it. So this that you see here is a spill box. We just put it in so that any water will run through, but you still hold the sand here as well. So if you look at it here, you see you have the berm all around and you have the equipment running and compacting it. So when you are doing the downstream that I talked about, this is what you do. The equipment keeps running back and forth and packing it up. And that's the same thing here. So just a picture here showing. This is where your pipeline is. You bring one here. You bring one here. This is where your spill box would be running out. And then you have the equipment packing it. And they keep packing. And they keep packing. They put the next lift on. And they keep going. And keep going. Okay. So that's how it works. So, 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 so. So it depends on your foundations. But sometimes one, if your foundations are really good, some people are as aggressive as four to do it. But sometimes it's one. A lot of the time, your foundations are not the greatest when you are doing this, and you want to be careful. But in a year, like for some mines that have been in a year, we build about four. So it all depends on your foundation. What, what kind of uh, layer do you use maybe uh, at the inner side of tailings dams or do you use any form of things? No, so for the external facilities we don't. We don't use any form. So what we do is, yeah, because we're talking about that today. Yeah. So what, what we do is that we just build it. You have ditches here. 
So the water just goes into the ditches and then we collect it all around and we send it for recycle. So we have ditches there, yes. If we see that there's a river beside, we have monitoring wells there. The moment that we see that, and we have pumping wells. So the moment we see that there's any contaminant from here going into the pumping well, we pump it right away, and then we return it back. Yeah. So that's we, we don't use we don't use liners. I know some people use liners. Yes. And then this, and we're talking about the disadvantage of the liners is that then this won't consolidate, okay? Mm. Because now you don't have under drainage to let it consolidate. So then it will just sit there forever. And yeah. it will be tough for you to close it. Yeah. Yeah. In Ghana, they are even recommending pitch stones, like pitch stone, where you naturally like mix uh, some stones with cement uh -huh. used to surface the base. So before, you, yes, before you start pumping, you obtain it. But in that case, do you have ditches all around? Yes, you still have. Oh, okay. I guess yours is different. But what we also do, so, so like I'm saying, it depends on how sensitive you are towards something else. Yes. And probably you guys have a lot of sandy material like I talked about. In Canada, there's a lot of clays. So by the time we start, we have it. But you see, the one thing with the tailings that people also have to understand is, so when you put these tailings, you remember how I said it's very clean? Yeah. So this will blind it off anyway. So why would you line it? Well, you have chemicals in there that are likely to Mm -hmm. well. No, but what I'm saying is the tailings that you are bringing in, if it's clay, yeah. it will line the side anyway. Okay. It will blind it yeah. off. Okay. So if it will blind it off, why would you do a double blind? It's something you should think about. I'm just no, we, we also, I'm not designing for no, you. I'm we, just we also don't line everywhere. It yes. depends on yeah, the environment, the nature of, uh -huh. the nature of your tennis you are building. Okay. So if you need, you really need it, you see that there is, you have done a lot of tests, you see that you, you need have a lot of fractured rocks around, around. there will be infiltration, and we ah. need to line it. Okay. So, so, there you go. so we also use the clay as liner as well, Okay. depending on where you find yourself. So, so okay. we have clay liner as well. As well. Okay. Yeah. No, we take a lot of advantage of the fact that whatever is coming in the tail is, like I said, it's clay, a lot of clay, and it will blind it off. If there's a little that will go through, we have it in the ditches and then we'll pick it up. Some of the ditches are lined to just to pick it up so that it doesn't go outside the environment. But it all depends on what type of material you have. Like I said, Ghana has a lot of sandy material, so it makes sense that if it's that of a high permeability, in the mines, they use sunlight for this uh, processing. Yeah, yeah, the so sunlight is yeah. Yeah. No, and actually, in the oil sands, so. In Canada today, there's the cyanide that we have to deal with. And then in the all sense, you have to deal with the family so the, environmental well. will, the environmental group will make sure that. Uh, mm -hmm. have but I mean, in your mind as an engineer, make sure that it makes sense so that you are not over designing, yes, yes. is all I'm saying. You got it. So if you have an area where it's clay, you can make the argument that there's already a clay layer there. Why would I double do it? So I'm just saying, think about it in that realm. Well. So but you don't have to line everything there. But you said, we also have wells around. Now we yeah. some we take some holes, yeah, to check to check, yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, um, where was I? So this one was just to show you at the position how we do it. I just threw this one in. This is more because we go into minus thirty degrees. We have to winterize every line. So you have to make sure that it's winter, otherwise all the lines will freeze. Yeah, and it was funny. There was one company that we worked with that. Um, they change the management. So I, I don't want to mention that. It's a very big uh, company that they change the management. And the management came in and then we we're going to winterize. And we we're going to spend, I think the winterization was going to cost about $5 million. Five or $6 million. Anyway. And then they were like, what? $6 million for winterization? We work in Russia. We don't winterize. Don't. <laughs> and then, you, you know how the Canadians are like Ghanaians. Okay. And then we all left it, and then all the lines froze. So, four days we're trying to bring it up. It cost the company four billion dollars. So, guess what will happen? Immediately, the CEO was recalled to Texas. Within two days, he was recalled back to Texas. Right away, they're like, "No, you're not staying here." So, anyway, so that's that. It was it was very interesting. So, you see, some of the guys they've written there. Oh, he didn't know. 
Not that winters are bad. <laughs> they have it on all the walls. Really interesting. But yeah, so we do that just to winterize. It costs a, a bit of money, but you need to do that. Otherwise, um, you freeze all the lights. Okay, and then I talked about the internal. So usually do investigation for the internal to understand how the deposit looks inside. I know it's now catching up in Ghana. People haven't started doing it yet. But I think it's important that you do what the internal components look like. So we pick samples, we take it to the lab, we characterize it, and we look at how it looks like. And then what we do is, oh. and then what we do is that, you see, we characterize it using geostatistic models. So we have models that we set park and stuff like that. It picks the nearest, so we, we put in investigation, it picks the nearest neighbor, and then it generates a model for us. And it tells us what is here, what is there, what is there, which one is consolidated more, what the fines look like and things like that. And based on that, the tailings planners use it to understand containment. So meaning that, oh, should we build this in a year? Should we build this two meters in a year or one meter? <laughs> so we use this to predict what it should look like. So this is very popular and then we have to send it to a regulator to have a look and they come back with a thousand questions. <laughs> but we still send it. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll go to managing and doing operations, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about down failures. Hopefully the internet works and we can look at the video, but if it doesn't, we just have to stay. But um, I'll talk a little bit about dump failures. So we talked about dams, and these are the main things that causes a, a dump failures. Overtopping, when there's extreme rain, and you don't have, you eat into your freeboard and then suddenly it overtops. There is piping, I talked about that. When the filter doesn't work very well, then you're going to have a lot of your clay going through, and then you're going to see some of your foundations coming up. And then when you have weak foundations, which you didn't expect. And of course, liquid faction, we talked about it. And then slope stability. I think we are pretty good at how to do slope stability. I know they're easy cry. When they mark first year, you crop, but you see armor. That's very easy to do. But I think the big one that is still a question, even in Canada, liquid faction is a little bit challenging to predict um, as well. And of course, to your question, when you raise dams excessively right you need to know how much you should raise in a year if you raise it too much by the time you realize it's gone and one dam that broke in china that was the reason they were raising it too much because oil oh, yeah, do hundred i have to build it as a machine kiki 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 and then that happened okay so that's something that you should uh, note so i just put these failure modes here basically we have the slope failure when you raise the dike poor construction when you step in it too much when you direct load it, that happens as well. And the foundation failure, that's on drain that I talked about. The big thing is clays. When you have sensitive clays, you are done. It's You really have to look at it. And then the surface erosion, that's the overtopping that I talked about. The internal is, is the piping. So we'll leave this with you. We can run through it and see all the other stuff that can make it do that. And I think I have talked about this, but we go through, and we just talked about this. We went through design and construction. Now you have the operations and the maintenance that we have to do. And then the external factors that can cause this, right? So the maintenance, the big thing is rates of deposition, and we talked about that. And then water management. If you are not able to manage your water well, you might end up at topic. So I quickly threw this in just to help people out here. So you can see that the big ones that happen, you see overtopping. That's the biggest one for all the dam failures. And then piping happens when you don't design your dam well. Earthquake and this it's it's very low. And in Ghana we don't have earthquakes in the Ashanti region to worry too much about it. But these are the big ones. Storing too much water. And then I just threw this one in and you realize that you see during the 60s and the 70s, that is when it goes up, right? And I think the the 70s and the 80s is when there wasn't a recession, things were going really well. So usually when things are going really well. You want to hurriedly build your dike so that you can extract more gold and sell it fast. That's when sometimes people forget and then all of a sudden you see a lot of failures. Okay. So this data is only for Canada or it's all over? Oh no, no, it's all over. This one is all over. This is all over. And then here, I just threw this in just to make you aware. So you see, for dams, when a dam is less than six years, that's where a lot of the activity happens. So something to note. So within your first year, second year, you really have to be watching it. When it starts getting old, you can see that now you have a handle on it. So your your 
within the last six years, this is where all the incidents occurred. So something that we should know. Um, so I just put all the incidents that has happened in Canada here. Um, a lot of them were in BC. And the last one that happened was in 2014. And actually, this is actually in court. And the engineers are being held to it for this one. They are being held. It happened in BC. And we'll talk about it. And then I think there it is. So, so this is the last one that happened. It happened in Mount Poly. And then it was over consolidated clay. So when we say that, it means that it's been loaded. The load has been removed, purely over consolidated. And you came to add another load. So all of a sudden, the core pressure just went up and then it came down. So. That's what happened. This is the dam here. So you can see this area, right? Right here. So you can see this is the dam here. It broke right through here and just destroyed a lot of things. So they had too much water to, when they investigated, they had too much water sitting in the dike. It shouldn't have been like that. And then they had some coming out, construction material. They had instruments. The funny thing is they had instruments in here. But exactly where they, it broke, Murphy's Law, they had no instrument there. So nobody knows what happened, but then it broke and then it came. And then, of course, there was a lot of environmental reputation damage. I think their stock fell by about 50%. And that's shareholders that have lost their money. So that's something with dams that you really have to be careful. Sometimes we think, oh, it's somewhere in a half or somewhere in a shanty region. But you're buying the stocks, you're a shareholder. If something happens, your money is gone. Basically, you're not getting it back. So right now, the operations were suspended and the mine is in care and maintenance. And that's somebody's investment that is worth that. So that's why the due diligence is extremely important. I don't know if this YouTube will work, but for this, you think it will? Oh. Okay, whether you could say something about the instrumentation, because just here you said they had instruments in there, but at the point where it failed, they didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can say something about instrumentation because sometimes you find out that some people say just plaster the thing with instrumentation in a regular grade. Yeah. Whereas sometimes doing an analysis of the structure helps you to see that oh, these are likely problems for you. And you put a bit more money to put the instrumentation in there. Because, like you said, Murphy's law. Yeah. I don't know what. So I don't want to, there's a whole, so actually if you go on YouTube, there's a whole investigation that goes down, and I was not involved in it, but what I know is the fact that the plasticine clay, I think it was mischaracterized. So at the time, I didn't see that it was over console, it was mischaracterized. They did have instruments in some of the clays there, but not that particular one, not that particular plasticine that was over consolidated. In terms of instruments, some of us are like, okay, let me put 50. Every 50 meters, just put one. But usually, when you are looking at the instrument, you need to put the instruments where the clays are weak or sensitive or you are not sure. That is where you put the instruments. And another thing you do too is that, so usually, you have design parameters. So maybe my design parameter was 0.5. Usually, put the instrument there to confirm that design parameter. So the observational approach comes in. If I confirm and I used 0.5 for my slope stability, and I start the instrument, the instrument is telling me it's 0.7, guess what? You have to go and redesign right away. If the instrument is telling me it's 0.4, I'm a happy camper. So that's why you put the instrument in as well for that. But you're right, the instrument is a lot of judgment to see where you want to put it. But you put it where you are not sure, where you think that this is what I got from the lab testing, but based on other things that I've seen, I don't think I'm sure. So you're going to put the instrument and as we build, I'm going to keep checking. And if it's not what it is, I'm going to do a redesign right away. The, the well. issue of keeping on checking, I remember there's a case where instruments were put in, mm -hmm. and that's what we call the movement, the chronometers, yeah. and the other part, part. And they were red. Uh -huh. And it showed excessive movement. Uh -huh. But that information was not communicated the designer in the office yeah. on a Friday, come Monday morning, the thing the panel had collapsed. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes you have the information, mm -hmm. but the people there don't really know the value of the information. Mm -hmm. They don't send mm -hmm. what is critical factors to whoever you can see. 
And that's why you have to use the operations and maintenance surveillance manual. And we can make it available, like um, Mind Association of Canada has all these three manuals that we have showing who a competent engineer is, and it's back to this. For a lot of the facilities, you need a, a design engineer, you need an engineer of record, okay? So the design engineer is doing the design, but the engineer of record is the one on site looking at this and saying there's something wrong that has to be done. For this one, it's interesting because initially they saw it, they saw something was happening. They actually started the buttress, but then they didn't finish the buttress and it happened. So you are right. If it's Friday, what happens? Probably someone is on the bar drinking. However, you need to try and get a <laughs> to say that you know what. This is what we are seeing. What should we do? And the big thing is when you see excessive movement like that, you are putting in a, a, a buttress. So for a lot of the designs that I've done, we make sure that we have enough buffer around, so that if something happens here based on what we saw, immediately we put in a tow bend. We put a tow bend right away. We put it in and then we think of what we want to do. So that's something that you try to incorporate in the design. But yeah, I I, I hear what you are saying. It does happen. But you need to get a guy from the bar and pay him. <laughs> so anyway, um, so we'll see if this will work. I'm not sure, but no, we didn't take it. Well, I, I'll leave it with you and then you can go in and look at um, the, the, the whole thing, how it broke. And the fact that you went into the fishery, um, another lake, and all that kind of stuff. And two years later, they are still trying to clean it up. And like I said, the, the dam is still in care and maintenance. So the question you are going to ask is, where are they getting the money to clean it up if they are not producing anything? But you have to. So it all ends up with the owners and the shareholders to foot the bill. Okay. So that's why surveillance is so important, that you have to do regular checks, go on the dam, look at it. If you see something wrong, Right away, flag it, and then we should have a look at it. Okay, so I just put this in as a reflection, thinking about whether a similar thing can happen here. Would there be any potential fatalities? For Mount Polly, there wasn't any community of interest around, which was great. So there wasn't any fatalities. But if you look at the dams that we have out there, there's a few communities around, and you have to think of that reflection and how that would work. Would there be that? What will happen to the water bodies around? What will happen to our life? So that's something to think about. <laughs> okay, so that's the question you asked, the surveillance program. So the program is basically to identify all the structures that require surveillance. So for that one, if you have about, so there was one company that I went with, I was looking after 24 downs. And what I had to do was that we had to prioritize which one is a risk this, so which one is riskier than the others, and the ones that are really low risk, we don't do a lot of surveillance of them, right? If it's going to break and it's just going to go into something that is within our lease, we wouldn't care as much as one that goes outside our lease. So the risk-based program is what you use to determine which one is more risky. So for the Mount Polly, that's something that we have done to say, you know what, these areas are more risky, let me instrument it more. So that's another approach that you use as well. And then you also have to assign personnel. And I know that's a discussion that I was just having with a colleague about what personnel need to be assigned. They need to be competent. And unfortunately, that's why people are using external people to do this, as we try to build up the engineering that we have here. But you need competent engineers to say, this is what will happen in an emergency situation. This is what a community of interest needs to do to be able to evacuate as well. And it just happened that South Africa and the others, like South Africa, Canada, US, have had more dam work for several years before and um, Ghana did. And that's why there is a bit of kind of external consultants doing this. But I think it would be nice if there is a transfer of that knowledge so that Ghanaians can do it too. Because I just heard that we are producing about 200 engineers, even in just civil engineering. I mean, when I was there, we we're just about 55. And I guess it's now about double, triple or quadruple. So it would be good to do that. Okay, so dam inspections and surveillance, what are we doing here? You need to recognize not one person is an expert. You need more people to do it. That's the only message I have here. If you want to look at the manuals like I talked about, they are available online. You can see them and how inspections are done, and then you can go from there. The instrumentation and monitoring, we talked about it. You need to put them in to understand what is happening. You need to put settlement in place to see what settlement is going on. 
and then you go from there. So these are vibratory wires. This is how they look. And you put it exactly into the area where you are worried about. And then with the inclinometers, you just, these are the pipes that go down in. And then when you go and read, you go with this, you read them in a um, clockwise and anti-clockwise direction. You bring it into the office. We look at the data and then we look at what kind of movement that we have. And then we go from there as well. So I just threw these pictures in just showing how some of the drill work is done, how we put it in for instrumentation. This is basically when we say that this is a vibratory wire, it's in a cell called nine, and it's the 144 that is put in. So basically one dam that I was looking at after we had about 700 instruments within that, just looking at it. So that's how much it is. So problem indicators. Usually you have to look out for things like settlement cracks and things like that. I'll just show some pictures here. This is an, a dam instability that occurred. These are cracks that you look at. So when you see these ones, you have to start looking at asking yourself what's going on. If the cracks are really deep, then you have to alert and repair as well. Oh, it went so quickly. So these are transverse cracking that also occurs. Usually you look, if it's, it's just on the surface, it's not a big deal. If it's deeper, then you want to excavate it and then break off that area. And then this is erosion that occurs. You just repair them as valleys. This is wave action. For example, if you have a lot of water, this is all frozen. I have a lot of water coming in. Sometimes it just erodes the crest and then you just want to that and these are boils. So usually when you see boils like this, it's onset of piping. Eh? So when you see any of the boils happening, it means that there's something happening to your dam. The clay core is coming out and you really have to check it. And then this is a sinkhole that occurred. Have a look at it. This is a slump or a slide. So you see when you load too much, that's what happens. The way you load, it just moves in. And imagine if we had equipment sitting here. That would have been a, uh, an incident that would have happened. So something. To, so it, usually what we do is that we give, so you can see the pipes here. We give a bit of a, an offset in terms of safety to make sure that if anything like this happens, it doesn't impact something. And then, of course, this is just pipeline breaks. When you are going on inspection, you just have to look for these. You see them, you just have to report them right away. Um, so this is end. I think I'm almost getting to the end here. This is the end of operation. So this is a closure that I was talking about, okay? So even in Ghana, this to operate, you need to have facility. You need to have a closure plan. So reclamation is ongoing, and you, some of you see it on your slopes where you put grass, you put plants, and things like that. In closure plants, we have the option of an empit lake. I know it's not very common in Ghana. I think slowly we'll introduce it. I think it's a good thing to use, um, especially for areas where if consolidation would occur, you think there will be water that will be expressed out. You use that area as an empit lake. And if you use it, all you have to do is treat it, make sure you can release it into the environment, and then you keep it as a lake. So that's something that in Canada is being advocated and used now. And of course, you have the pond capping that you have to do as well. Sometimes for hard rock mining, if you have an underground mine, you can just transfer all your tailings underground and then you seal it off. Okay. So we used to do that in Canada as well. So the empit lakes look like this, where you have a pit, you have an initial area where you just grassed it up. And then these are pilots that were done just to see if they are viable. But in the oil sands, the big thing is naphthalic acids. So we're looking at that. And they actually work. So this is something that has been put in the plant. So usually for Canada, if you want to do anything like this, they need to see that you have researched into it and it's viable before you can put it in your plant. So that's what happened with this one. And this is pond capping that we cap it as well. I'll show another one that shows. So this is work that was done. So this is a pond, very soft, and they decided to cap it. But then they were capping it with something that we call coke. It's a byproduct from fraught tailings, right? And then they decided to cap it. So this is called Sankor Pond 5. 
It's the first pond ever to be capped in the world. And then they managed to cap it. They had to do some geotextiles and put the coke on it. They also had to put in some weed drains. For those who know about weed drains, weed drains just take some of the water off. So you can see them working in the winter, putting it in, and then they capped it. So it's one of the first to be capped in the world. So it's, it's pretty interesting. So in summary, when you have a live tailings um, landform that has to do, you have to do the design, construction, you do your site investigation, you repeat again, any learnings from each phase of the project, you apply it in real time. And that's the observation approach that I was talking about. And you allow the designs to be adjusted and optimized. So we don't have the answer, but then we are going to do it. And if we see that we have a better answer, you need to say, you know what, I'm revising it, okay? So what I keep saying is that civil engineers don't make mistakes. We just make revisions. <laughs> so we keep making revisions to try. <laughs> That's what we do. Okay. I guess do this thing because of all the discussion going on on stakeholder engagement. So stakeholder engagement is key, but I threw this in because we've had a situation in um, Canada where the regulatory landscape has put so much pressure on stakeholders that we've seen a lot of major companies leaving the country. Okay, so you really have to be careful in terms of stakeholder engagement. If the stakeholders are asking for too much, you have to realize that the company needs to provide shareholder value. And if they feel that it's too expensive, they're going to sell and leave. So we really have to be careful on how we do it. We had three companies leave. We had Shell, we had Total, and we had Start Oil leave Canada because of the regulatory landscape, not just the regulatory, but the demands from the stakeholders as well. Because in the end, it's not a charity. They have to make money as well. So something that I thought I should uh, let you guys know, you, you can go through that as well. So because stakeholders are not supposed to make the decisions. We're supposed to talk about technical people, what needs to be done and the risk and prepare them for any emergencies, right? And that's the discussion that needs to happen. They, they can't make it because they are not the technical people. But I just thought I should throw it in there because of how far ours went and where it went to in terms of that. Okay. So the last one is the Sankor Pond one that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is one of the first to be reclaimed also in the world. And this is where it is. It's in Fort McMurray, sitting here. Actually, all these are tailing sites. Just so you show, but this is where it is. And then, this is the history. I'm not going to go through their history. They started somewhere in 1964, and they kept building, they kept building, they kept building. In 1964, they got the tailings very close to the river. But as time went on with Greenpeace and everybody, everybody was screaming about it, and they really wanted to reclaim it and at least have it all done nicely. So that's what they did here. So in 2006, they decided that and actually, this was a top-down decision that came. The CEO said, I'm giving you three years. You have to finish reclaiming this. And my grandmother should be able to walk from here here. OK, that's what he said. My grandmother should be able to walk from here and get there. So that was their challenge. They had to do it. So this is how it went through. And then they decided to do a landscape goal. They looked at the area. What can we bring in? They targeted wildlife and all that. They also looked at the geotech as well. It has to be geotechnically stable. I need to make sure that I create a landscape that has suitable cells to work. And then they created a small wetland. And that's what I talked about in Empit Lakes. They look at that, but they created a small wetland. And then it had to support wildlife and traditional land uses. And the question is, what is traditional land uses? So in Canada, we have indigenous people. That's the First Nations. And they have particular just like our village they have particular cultures that they have and they prefer that you bring those things back so a lot of the time we try to incorporate as much as we can as long as it doesn't impact the stability of it that's when we do it okay so that's what happened so they went in did a site investigation looked at everything and what was in there they created a buttress filled it in oh it doesn't go <laughs> filled it in and then this is what they came up with so now they have a small pond here. This is how we're going to do. They sketched it out. This is how the pond is going to look like when it's done. The indigenous people can come in and boat around like they want to do. And then they kept going. This is how the swills are going to look like. 
we're going to direct everything in here and then go from there. So the next one, they brought in a few, we call them hammocks. They brought in some hammocks here, hammocks there, and then everything is directed into this area. A lot of the slopes you can see is H1 and flatter. And the reason we do that is because we want to make it so flat that we have minimal maintenance to do when um, we come in. We don't want to do any maintenance. If you get it done, it's done. So you make it really, really flat so that it doesn't erode. So this is a model that was used to generate it. You can see that now we have it all in there. And then they kept going. They expected a settlement of three meters. So they accommodated that settlement in the design. This is a swale that is being built. You can see they are using D9 and D10 just to build it. And then this is the geotextile that is um, GCL that is being rolled out for softer areas just to help it out. And then this is still GCLs trying to work it through, as you can see here, just to help with the soft areas. And then they ended up with subs. So there was some low strength subsoil that had to be uh, worked with. But then they tried as much as they could. In fact, I think this one, did they lose a dozer? No, they didn't. A dozer went in, but they pulled it out, basically. But then that's what they had to do. They really used that geogrid to stabilize it as they went through it. They had to work in the in the winter. That was tough. Like I said, Canada grew to about minus 30 degrees. So that's really tough to work in. But they did the best that they could. And the frozen conditions really helped because then you can go on the pond and you don't have a lot of um, um, issues to deal with. And so this is how it looked like. All the models that were generated looked similar to what it was. So in 28, 2008, this is how it looked like. 2009, this is where they expected to be. 2010, this is what they expected to get. And that's exactly what they did. They got the whole thing with all the hammocks that I talked about in here. And then they had the whole thing there as well. And so this is how it looks like. So in June 2010, this is how it was looking like. They had put all the sand in. They had cleaned it all up, removed all the clays. And this is what it looked like. And you can see the river is right there. You see that's a river right there. Running through the River. 2011, this is what it looks like. It's all nicely done. And the river runs through here. And basically, this was before, now you can see the after. This is done. So this is one of the ones that has been cut, like since all this mining started. This is one that pretty challenging, but then they were able to pull it off and then finish it all up. And I think basically this is the monitoring that they had to do. So remember all the visual inspections, vegetation, wildlife, and right now, to be very honest, there's so many bears that nobody can even go there now. All the wildlife came back. And that's how it's expected to be. Like all the wildlife came back. And yeah, this is it. Thank you. Yeah, so so in Canada it's more like, so we have um, something called APEGA, just like the institution, Alberta Professional Engineers and Geologists, and they are the ones that relate all the engineering profession. So it's pretty simple, if I'm just geotech, that's all I have to do, and dealings, that's it. But the companies take insurance for every engineer that they have. In terms of, I'm thinking of do you get the insurance companies actually um, influencing the fact that you've got to pay people of a certain company? I mean, it's one thing to qualify, it's quite another thing to be an engineer, and a qualified engineer with so many years experience. No, no, the insurance companies have nothing to do with that. So, for example, if we are doing interviews, like I do interviews, we just get the people in, we shortlist them, 
we look at it and we see whether you fit that job. And sometimes we train you in that technical skill to be competent to do that work. So, and, and also we're, we're having this discussion on all this kaluta that is going on. I was talking about behavior. So, to be very honest, you might see someone who might be less knowledgeable in something being hired because they see that he has such good behavior that they will be able to put that technical skill in that person. I mean, if I finish when I finish my undergrad, what do I know? Right? But it's as you work and who you listen to and how you do the work takes you there. And people are more interested in the behavior for you to get there rather than um, how smart you are. Because being an engineer, you are pretty smart to have gotten there anyway. So that's how, and usually when we do the interview, that's what we do. We have half of it that is purely behavioral, and it's just the other part that is technical because if the behavior is there, we can get you into that technical skill. We need a soft skill to be able to get it. I don't know, maybe what the engineer was talking about, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the insurance companies coming out with premiums, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, have, they can calculate the premium based on maybe who project that the competency of personnel on the job. I don't think they do that. They don't they, do that. No, no, no. They don't, no, do that. Do that. They, they don't have. They don't, have, they don't know who is competent. Yeah. They can't do that. Maybe I give you an extreme example. Okay. I worked with a fellow in the UK. Came down to Ghana for a couple of years. Went back to the same firm. And as soon as I walked through the door. My former boss pointed to me, called the job number of the last job I worked for, and told me that we were in court, you know, we were being sued. Okay. Now, we were working for a developer who a contract, a large contractor who had a development department. And they were suing us for the job on which I worked for uh -huh. because something had gone wrong. However, the very next week, the same people came in to talk to us about another job. Yeah. Right, working with us. And you know, I went to my boss and said, Well, these people are here, how come we are talking to them? And he said, So it's their insurers who are forcing them to sue us. You see? And sometimes the insurance companies, in order to bring down their losses and things like that, I thought might influence you know the sort of firm that you go in for. On another job that I worked for, I was told by the director that the only reason we got the job was because we were such a big firm that they could sue us for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they couldn't do that with a five-man firm. They just couldn't get that money if something went wrong. But if you uh, sort of have got a much bigger firm, you can sue them for that kind of money. So yeah, it's the uh, insurance companies who sort of pay up the bill who can influence these sort of decisions. Like, Oh, I see. No, I, I, I don't think um, in terms of the insurance firms influence that. I know that for consulting firms, you need to have a yeah. insurance liability kind of professional liability. But then, so that if something happens and they have to pay off somebody, they do. And I remember one company that I worked. This was a funny story, I know. And they decided to never put engineers on the on the stand anymore because what happened was that it was the it was something to do with the well. And then they pumped the whole town dry. And then the town suddenly didn't have water, right? So the city decided to sue the company. And so they said, okay, we'll put the engineer on the stand, they explained everything. So he went on the stand, and then the lawyer comes, very intimidating, looked at this engineer. Okay, say your name. And he had forgotten his name. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So he eventually had to take his wallet. Take his driver's license and read his name. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, the company said, No, we're going to settle every lawsuit. We will never put any engineer on that stand anymore. So I know that they settle lawsuits, but they, the insurance company doesn't have anything to do with it. I work with a bigger corporation, and it's a corporation that insures us, that's all. We do a lot of in-house work. And when yeah. you're insured, and the insurers pay that money when something goes wrong, mm -hmm. as a professional, or yeah. whatever it is, they somehow want to get as much of that money back. Oh, and I see. they can get you to sue and get some of that money, money back. back. It's no longer yeah. a loss, and therefore, yeah. they don't have to pay you. Okay. Yeah, Canada doesn't do a lot of lawsuits. Canada is a 
It's a little bit delayed back in terms of US likes to do that, but Canada doesn't do it. Well. They prefer to arbitration, let's do, let's talk about this and then let's move on. Yeah. So there isn't yeah, there isn't a lot of yeah, there isn't a lot of that. Um, so I don't know if it's it's in Ghana now, but uh, I, I, I think um, I know that Ghana we I started employing yes, okay. It's kind of an insurance stuff. Yeah. They want to now look at uh, engineering involvement to quantify some of the, the risks. I think that they are clients, you know, to sign off. Okay. So it's, I think, the gradual process. Okay. Getting the but but so the insurers can't tell who is competent. Mm -hmm. That is so, like, I don't know how they will tell who is competent. Because even within our companies, it's a very tight thing telling who is competent in what. You get know what I mean? It's it's the government body that needs to do that. So I don't know how the insurance companies will be able to then say, oh, you don't have, the people you have are all less than four years experience. So now I'm going to let you pay two million for insurance. I, I don't know how they'll do that. Well, that's what they do. I mean, I remember I had to work on a job. There was a gentleman who had three years experience and he was put on that job. Because, I mean, obviously, had a basic qualification, but with so many years of experience on that specific type of work, made the insurers a lot more comfortable. Oh, okay. I see. So maybe I should come back to Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we don't do it formally. Okay. Phone calls, phone calls, and asking. Oh, and it's you know, it's not the requirement they like, but they don't do it behind the scenes. Oh, okay. Interesting. No, we, we can't that do that. Just that I mean, in Canada, of course, we have competent people that sign off. So we have, so we have one for geotech, we have one for tailing, we have one for hydro. So we have principals for that, and then other people work at the end that. That's what, so like when I sign for tailing, I'm principal for it, but that's it. You sign for it, but other people work do the work as well. And I, and that you have to report to the government body. You just report the top names, and that's it. It's not. It's not tied to insurance at all. That's a, that's an interesting concept. And you have a specialist body. I know you said you've got this sort of technical engineer or this is yeah. that okay. Okay. But do you have a specialist body for that who can look at the city of this? No. So we do. So we have the Canadian Dam Association. That does a lot of that. We have Mind Association of Canada that looks at a lot of those. So they come up with the guidelines. They come up with the OMS and all that. And then we have the we have COSIA, uh, Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. And that one was set up because we realized that the mining companies were not talking to each other. So for example, we have this consultant, they'll charge me like maybe four million dollars for the same thing and then use my same thing. So go and charge another company eight million for the same. So later we are like, why are we doing this? So we came up with that alliance where all the mining companies talk together. So for example, if X does the work, I can call them up and say, you know what, I need that report, and they give it to me. So that's how we started that. So those um, organizations exist to release guidelines, and sometimes the regulators adopt it, and then everybody uses it. But because it's an alliance, we tend to use the guidelines together as well. So we have that. It's not an oversight. The oversight is still the company's accountability. But these are tools and guidelines to help you do the work. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Well, from your presentation, it looks like Canada likes a lot of money. And here in Africa, we're also supposed to be this. Yeah. But the other thing is, um, I, I want to suggest to the institution, the other thing is, if what if it could be a system such that if I wanted to do this, I could have paid colleagues who are not that way that they be able to get to know what's happening mm -hmm. so, that, so that they can also give an advice. I'm saying this because on a doctor basis, I'm probably one person who died uh, when a politician plays, a party may not play, a different person. <laughs> but what they did have to do is just help. Yeah. So, All right, noted. Yeah, that's noted. But in terms of ponds, um, just to clarify that, we have the ponds. But the intent is to cut them all. That's why I showed you the capping. Okay, the intent is to cut them all, not to leave them no. And I think that's the same thing with Ghana too. 
Because of the mosquitoes, you are better off going for soil covers rather than keeping the ponds with water. You want to go with soil covers and then cut them off. So that's the intent. I, I think that's the same thing that everybody wants to do. So today we've got malaria cases. In underground or yeah, on surface, mechanically placed. So mechanically placed is the best, but it's expensive. You know what I mean? It's expensive, and that's why people look at the hydraulically placed. Because hydraulically placed, I have the pipeline just coming from the mill, and then I just have to do, I just have to control it. But mechanically placed, it means that it has to be dry. You have to bring it. You need hot trucks to bring it in. So think about it. If you are in Canada with Greenpeace telling you, "Oh, you are bringing a hot truck. GHGs at the end of the of the track. This and that, and then it becomes a little bit more expensive. And if you have carbon pricing, which we are getting, then it means that now everything is going. So mechanical is usually the best, but it's expensive. And I think that's one thing that, and that's what made me end up at the NBA. Everybody's is like, "Why are you doing an NBA? I think what helped me there was trying to tie the technical with economics. When you are so technical, you tend to be so conservative, but sometimes you need to look at the economics and optimize. So if you look at both and you're like, oh, I can afford the tables and it's cheaper, why not? Why would you go mechanical? But there are certain situations where you have no choice. Maybe you are too close to a boundary. So you want to include a bit of mechanical placement. So you can mix the two. Yeah. So uh, what what do you suggest in say gold mining situations? When you go to start a mine, you have an initial pit with a particular mine line, and you design your tailings dam based on that. But as time goes on, gold prices increases, technology gets better, then you have the chance to open it up. So as you are opening up, you still have the same design. So you keep building it up. So will it be better if you have a secondary cell, so that if this one is full, it will overflow and get into the secondary one. But so as you open up your pit, so remember that these are proven reserves, right? Yeah. So just like oil, they are already proven reserves. So before you start your tailings down, you already know how much tailings you are going to get. Because whatever amount that you extract as gold, you know what tailings you are going to get. Okay. So when you are building your external tailings facility, to account for it that I know some companies out and go and then they start with the smaller one and then they do that plan for the whole reserve proven reserve that you have and to be fair if your foundations can take it why would you build another facility if your foundations can allow you to go higher and higher you still want to try and go higher and higher until it's at a point where you can't raise it anymore and then you stop it, rather than build another one because you are creating, you are going to do another land disclaimer <laughs> somewhere else. Someone is going to say, Men coco, oh, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. you, you know what comes in with all the community of interest. So why don't you just yeah, raise that one and say, That's in your question. Yeah, okay. Thank you. We're talking about capital. So what we do is that we do it. So we do a sand balance, right? We know what is coming in. We know how much will be left. So we use sand or sometimes waste. So if we don't have enough sand, then we bring in waste. But a lot of the time we use sand because it's cheaper to hydraulically place it on. Yeah. So we we, we create we do a sand balance to make sure that actually the regulator asks us for it because our whole closure plan was on sand capital. They are like, where is all the sand coming from? So we did a sand balance and then one areas where we don't have it, we put in waste. So yeah. Yeah. Has, there, has there been any uh, case where you uh, go back to your tailings or uh, to see if you can uh, make uh, extract minerals, for example, and uh, justify it by um, uh, justify your uh, going back by saying that maybe uh, if you have enough, you would. Uh, maybe maintain their own better or something. Has it ever happened? <coughs> so that's what I said. If, so we have 4% beauty in the ponds, right? So if oil goes to $200 a 
embargo. I'm pretty sure the CEO will tell us to go back and extract. We bad. That hasn't happened. Gold, I don't think so. Yeah. Like in my experience with hard rock, I don't know. I don't know whether we can know what I've heard of. We just have a company. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. Gold man, and also in the copper man. I am the highest producer of copper. He has rather about four and then like based on the business. Now, over price is shooting up to the market or something, and that's because of that. The CEO said, No, we have to go and mine. <laughs> Unfortunately, we produce asset tables, so the facility is lined with German, and because of that, there's no observation. The is very soft, and any small material disturbance from that. So it's very difficult to mine, so we have to come up with a plan. We just started mining just about two months ago. I produced the hydraulic method and all this product. So now we started earlier, small pump where we started pumping. Then we just came to the buried all the, the fruits, badges, and everything. We have to come up with another plan. So now we are doing a lot of technical investigation. Because the CEO just imposed that. Go here, start with the bad year, start <laughs> Now, we didn't do any characterization of the tables that we have, whether we be able to mine it by the method that we wanted it. So now, we have to use the market to take samples to South Africa and bring the other country in by Last month, we have all the design to be able to know the best approach. Because the earlier on brought them guys, Jose uh, Alexander. But they have mined consolidated things. So from that, the person was not lying. They came and then they came. But you see, it and ends up with costs. Yeah. Yeah. See? So that's what I was talking about. The CEO said we should do it, but was any economics done? Yeah, we did the economics. It and then it's realized that. At the end of the mining, we made more than ten billion dollars. Wow. Okay. So he was even saying that if you need to bring aircraft, you <laughs> 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 have to find But at the end of the day, you make from here. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes to that. It goes to the economy. So like, if it goes to two hundred, it goes to two hundred dollars a month. We are definitely going to mine it, but we haven't done that yet. It's not up to that. It's only like. 75 or 80 right now, so it's very interesting. <laughs> All right, I'm sure we've gotten a very good discussion, but as the panel listeners are about to move to a conclusion, we are closing it, right? All right, so I'll be thank you very much for coming. Monica, we thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. I hope next time when you are coming, I'll let me so that I can arrange for another meeting. Sure. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have some snack at the back there. Let's just do it as we continue to interact. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,